Salutations, this is David and welcome back to Almost a Country. A series in which I search for some old graves, try to recognize letters on ancient newspapers and most importantly try to share with you my love for failed attempts to declare a country. In the last episode I covered the Central European Lemko Republic, which lasted one year. Be sure to watch it if you hadn't done so already. In this episode I will provide you a closer look on the Kingdom of Andorra. As many of you probably know, Andorra is a principality in the Pyrenees Mountains. A legend tells that it was founded by the Emperor Charles the Great himself as he marched against the Saracens who were invading the Iberian Peninsula. Since the dawn of its existence it was ruled by two co-princes who ruled it equally together. Today it is the French president and the Bishop of Urgell, an episcopal seat in Catalonia. Originally however the co-principate was tied to the titles of Count of Foix and Count of Bern. Andorra also has one of the oldest parliaments in Europe, called the General Council of the Valleys. During the first half of the 20th century, Andorra experienced a difficult period as it was underdeveloped and rarely cared for by the co-princes in other matters than subordination. The constant pressure of the General Council by the co-princes caused riots, clashes with the gendarmerie and inclination of the population to communism and anarchism. Into this situation came Boris Kasarev, a mysterious Russian whose life we need to track since his very beginning to fully understand the Kingdom of Andorra. It is unknown when Boris Kasarev was born or even where. He himself claimed multiple times that he was born in Vilnius by the time a territory of the Russian Empire in 1896 into a minor noble family. In 1917 came the Bolshevik Revolution and Boris allegedly fled Russia. Claiming to be a white Russian emigre, he joined the British military and served as a translator to a Japanese military mission in London. In 1918 he left this job because of an unspecified conflict with a Japanese officer. In 1919 he was arrested for not paying his checks and later that year expelled from the United Kingdom. What Boris was doing after 1919 until 1931 is somewhat unclear. He provided unspecified special services to the royal family of the Netherlands, for which he was given the title Count of Orange. It is very likely Boris was acting as a spy on their behalf. He also established an import-export agency in Guatemala, a type of company which often served as a cover for spies. In 1931 Boris married a Frenchwoman Maria Luisa Parrot. During their marriage, Boris had many affairs, one of them being especially important. In 1932, he emerged on Mallorca, where he claimed to be an English and PE teacher. There he met and started a relationship with Florence Moore Marman, a woman getting divorced from marriage with Howard Carpenter Marman an American multimillionaire, the founder of Marmon Motor Car Company. Being a former wife of a millionaire, she possibly got a tremendous amount of money from the divorce. Money, which Boris utilized few years later, when his Andoran adventure began. In 1934, strange reports regarding Andorra began to appear in major European newspapers. Some claimed a wealthy resident of Barcelona approached the General Council with an offer of large investments in exchange of becoming a King of Andorra. Others claimed an American entrepreneur attempted to buy Andorra. My personal belief is that both versions point to Boris 
since he lived in Barcelona around that time and his source of money was his lover, a former wife of an American industrialist. What we know for sure is that Boris managed to be granted Andorran citizenship and approached the General Council of the Valleys with a reform program, which would lead to a complete reconstruction and modernization of the country. He was subsequently expelled from Andorra and took up residence in Urgell. After renting a room in local hotel, Boris Kosarev proclaimed himself King Boris I of Andorra, a regent for His Majesty the King of France. One would think he simply went mad. He didn't. The current co-prince of Andorra on the French side was President Albert Lebrun. But royalists claim that the co-principate of the French Republican government is illegitimate, as it is derived from the titles Count of Foix and Count of Bern, which were inherited by monarchs of Navarra, who eventually became the royal house of France. According to the royalists, the rightful holder of those titles was, at the time, Jean d'Orléans, Duke of Guise. Boris contacted representatives of the royalist movement, and together they devised a plan. In a week, French royalists swarmed the southern France and caused widespread general unrest in the name of the Duke of Guise. This distracted the French government and provided some legitimacy to Boris's proclamation. And then something fascinating happened. On the 8th of July, 1934, the General Council of the Valleys of Andorra accepted the claim of Boris I. 24 councillors voted for establishment of a royal Andorra, with only one councillor voting against. The newly made king then relocated to Andorra la Vella, where he began to issue a magazine, monitoring the events at the court, the so-called Court Circular. He wrote a constitution, organized his coronation, and designed a brand new royal flag. He became Boris I, Prince of the Valleys of Andorra, Count of Orange, Baron of Skosarev, Sovereign of Andorra, and Defender of the Faith. After being confirmed as a king by the aforementioned vote, he got down to designing the reforms he planned for Andorra in detail. As mentioned before, Andorra of those days was poor, struggling, half-medieval society, lacking infrastructure, development, electricity, resources, and, honestly, even attention of its leaders. The plan of His Majesty the King Boris was surprisingly very sane, given the state Andorra was in during the 1930s. It involved investment of the large amount of his lover's money into new infrastructure, modernizing Andorra and growing a new backbone for its economy by establishing luxurious tourist resorts, casinos, more liberal laws compared to the world standard and transforming into a tax haven. It may be just a feeling, but doesn't that seem somehow familiar? The first step towards fulfillment of his vision of a new Andorra was transforming Andorran political structure into a form that would allow him to control it more. The General Council of the Valleys, consisting of 25 councillors at the time, was led by a syndic. A crucial part of Boris's plan was to convince the General Council to vote in favour of abolishing itself, so he could declare a reformed provisional government and start working on a new modernized parliament. To be able to do that, Boris Kosarev met Pere Torres, who was the syndic at the time. In exchange for Torres's help in convincing the rest of the stakeholders of the wisdom of his plans, King Boris promised his syndic's closest councillors, ministerial functions and the position of Andorra's first prime minister to Pere Torres himself. Everything seemed to go surprisingly well. So well that Albert Lebrun, the president of France, declared that the French government respected the decision of the Andorran people. However, there was no reaction from the Bishop of Urgell so far. On the 10th of July, 
the General Council was summoned to ratify Boris's kingship by voting once more. It was as before, 24 against one sole councillor. According to the novel Boris I, King of Andorra by Anthony Moray, which is based on the memories of Arthur's grandmother, the sole councillor who had twice voted against Boris and his plans, went that night home mad with anger, said farewell to his wife, mounted a donkey and rode through the night to Orgel, where he requested an audience with the bishop. Bishop Justi Guitard Iviardebo was informed about the reforms Boris planned. He was all ready to follow the lead of Albert Lebrun in this matter, until he heard that the part of the king's plan is construction of casinos. Bishop Justi considered casinos to be highways to hell, so he publicly ordered Catalan Jardimery to arrest Boris Kasarev and escort him to Barcelona. In an attempt to save his dream kingdom from crumbling, on the 12th of July, King Boris declared a war on the Bishop of Urgell and on 14th of July issued a press release in which he, he warned Spain and France that he had 500 volunteers in both countries armed and hidden, ready to defend his cause. None appeared, however, and Boris was deposed, arrested and transported to Madrid, where the courts ended his rule over Andorra. He was stripped of all his personal possessions and expelled to Portugal. So ended the ten days of Kingdom of Andorra. But given how the beauty of this project was undividable from the man himself, let's go through the rest of his known life. Boris lived on. He was seen mingling with elites and celebrities in Salazar's Portugal, before being expelled from there too. After a lot of travelling, across southwestern Europe and northwestern Africa, in 1938 French authorities allowed him to settle down in Aix, because he was still officially married to Maria Louisa Parrot. A year later he was interned in a French forced labor camp in Le Vernet, and some sources claim that he died there. The fact is that he was liberated by Wehrmacht invasion forces in 1943 and employed by the German Reich as Sonderführer, a special officer, who performed unspecified and undocumented tasks on the Eastern Front. After the end of the Second World War, he settled down with his wife in Bopart, in West Germany. In 1948, he was surprisingly found and arrested in Eisenach, East Germany. He was imprisoned and sent to a Siberian labor camp. He returned to Bopart in 1956 and lived quietly until dying of old age in 1989, presumably being 93 years old. That is what we know from the surviving documents. The true Boris Kosarev might have been a completely different person. But one thing is for sure. Boris's Kingdom of Andorra laid foundations to what Andorra is today. No one can deny that. If you liked what you just saw, be sure to like it, share it and subscribe to upcoming episodes of Almost a Country. Also, let me know who do you think Boris Kosarev actually was. In my personal opinion, he was a freelance international spy. Stay with us for the next episode, where I will give you the Republic of the Almighty Don Cossack Host.